Thanks, Jeff. And Boy, I thought he was going to go to preach in there for a little while. You did good there. You did good. You have a thief on the cross. What a great message. See, I get to talk to you about when you can get married or not, and that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alan was talking about, you know, appreciating the fact that I just preach whatever's next, and I do, because truthfully, I'm not sure that I would have picked a, uh, to preach on this verse, that, that she, but she is happier if she remains as she is, in my opinion, and I think also of the Spirit of God. I mean, those, those are tough verses. You know, what did Paul mean when he says, better to stay unmarried, you know? And, and if you're married, you've got to be very careful of your expressions and how much you respond to these uh, verses as we read them very much. Uh, but we do, we have been looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and the whole chapter, it deals with the secret of living happily ever after. I, that's just my title. It's actually a section on just what does God say about marriage? And and Paul has addressed this, but the different audiences. And so in verses 1 through 11, he spoke to Christians who are married to Christians. And you should read through that, and it's good material. There's also, in their day, and also occasionally it happens here too, where um, uh, a couple will, one of the couple will receive Christ and the other not be a Christian. And so how do you work all of that out? How do you, how when, when, when one spouse is, uh, starts going to church and gets saved, and, and as we saw last week, the quotation from the surgeon, and um, they said, you know, my wife was now listening to another man. There was another man in our house that was in charge, and he wasn't sure he liked that. He said she wasn't the same person that he fell in love with, and the Lord changed her. And we've all heard the, the stories from that. And so what do you do when you're married to a non-Christian? Well, today we come to the final group, which really there's four subgroups that he addresses in this. But primarily, it's, it's unmarried Christians. What's God's message to those? Well, let's read together the passage, and we're going to look this morning at verses 25 through the end of the chapter, through 40. It says, Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I do give an opinion as one who, by the Lord's mercy, is faithful. Because of the present distress, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released." Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. However, if you get married, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But such people will have trouble in this life. And I'm trying to spare you this. This is what I mean, brothers and sisters. The time is limited. So from now on, those who have have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they didn't own anything. And those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For this world in its current form is passing away. I want you to be without concerns. The unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord so that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But the married woman is concerned about the things of the husband, of things of the world, how she may please her husband. I am saying this for your, for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, but to promote what is proper and so that you may be devoted to the Lord without distraction. If any man thinks he is acting improperly toward the virgin he is engaged to, if she is getting beyond the usual age for marriage and feels he should marry, and he feels he should marry, he can do what he wants. He is not sinning. They can get married. But he who stands firm in his heart, who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will and has decided in his heart to keep her as his fiancée will do well. So then he who marries his fiancée does well, and, but he who does not marry will do better. A wife is bound as long as her husband is living, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to anyone she wants, only in the Lord. And she is happier if she remains as she is, in my opinion. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Father, This um, I just pray you give me wisdom, and I pray that the clear meaning of this text would come forward through my words and through the lesson that I've prepared, and and I do pray, God, you would uh, teach us all, including me, by your Holy Spirit, so we know uh, what Paul was really meaning here. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. 
Now, this is a challenging passage, not, some not so challenging others. Other parts of it are very challenging indeed. And what in the world does he mean by this? And, and also, uh, was Paul married? No. And so the comments that he makes about marriage are from his observation of marriage, not from his experience. And, and he, uh, twice he, he refers to this as being his opinion. And so does that mean it carries less weight than other scripture? No, but he's very clear in this that he's not giving a command. He's giving his opinion as one who has the Spirit of God. And I think you have to kind of, not to rise above where you ignore the words, I think you have to understand the words in the context that he's trying to offer them. And maybe the key to understanding the whole passage is in verse 35. I'm not, he's not trying to put a restraint, he says, but to promote what is proper so that you may be devoted to the Lord without distraction. That's his whole point of this message is how, if you are married, how can you be married and still be devoted to the Lord with all that you have? And and there's a path for that, I think, even clearly in the Scripture. And so it is a bit challenging, so we're going to work our way through it, and we're going to look at the four subgroups that are represented here. And the first one is what we'll call the happily unmarried. <laughs> okay, not married, and they're fine with that. Okay, they're not, not looking to be married. I mean, uh, he says about virgin, I give no command, but I do give an opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is faithful. Because of the present distress, verse 26, I think it is that it's good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. And then where are we going down to? Verse 27. So yeah, that's it. So this happy, happily uh, unmarried, he's saying, remain as you are. Remain as you are. Now, this is assuming, as we looked at two weeks ago in verse six uh, or verse seven of chapter seven, he says, "I wish that all people were as I am, but each one has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, another that. I think the ability to to remain single is indeed a gift from the Lord. Not everybody has that gift." And uh, I certainly didn't. And uh, many of us in this room that are married, obviously we didn't think we had that gift. But if you have that gift, man, remain as you are. Why? Because there was some cultural, there was some things time-wise that were related to the writing. Notice he refers to it in verse 26 where he says, because of the present distress. Well, what is that? Well, the, it doesn't say. Um, there. There existed, though, in Corinth, for whatever reason, maybe it was throughout the Roman Empire, there was a present distress that was affecting the church here. And whether that, um, some writers have suggested that this was the beginnings of persecution from Rome or from the Jewish segment of the cultures. Remember the, the gospel went first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Um, but others have suggested, if, in fact, if you know a little bit of history, Acts chapter 11, there was, and not just in Acts 11, there are certainly other times too, but there was an occasional um, difficulties in Acts 11. It speaks of a famine. It says in verse 27, in those days some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Abagus, or Agabus uh, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. And then, of course, Luke writes, this took place um, during the reign of Claudius. Each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who lived in Judea. This, they did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. So there, there was some stress and there was some struggle. There was this present distress. Imagine what it would be like to go through a famine. I would think that it would be difficult enough to go through a difficult time, whether it's persecution or a famine, by yourself. Imagine now you have a wife and some children along with you. Um, uh, I'll be honest, sometimes the direction that I, I am concerned about when I see the, na the direction our nation is heading, I'm concerned about the future. And, about, and, and not so much for me. Dee Dee and I are, you know, I'm, I'm turning 60 here in a couple weeks. I'm, you know, I'm kind of getting towards the end. Of, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready to be called the third base, you know almost home, but, you know, I'm rounding, I'm rounding something, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not second base anymore, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I'd have to be, live to be 120, and that ain't going to happen, I, I won't give up Pop-Tarts, so that's not happening, so, you know, 
So I know I'm somewhere between second or third, and some of you, you can, it's your own opinion, I'll have mine of yours too if you say something. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, imagine going through that. It's easier for me to, if it was just me, but now it's me and Didi, and now it's me and my kids and my grandkids. And, you know, those do cause distress. Let's not be, let's be honest about that. We, we, those things cause, cause stress. And then, now he, he deals with another group here in verses 28 through 35, So to the happily unmarried, he says, man, remain as you are. To the unhappy unmarried, (laughs) he says, count the cost. Count the cost. Notice he doesn't say get married. In fact, he says, uh, if you, however, verse 28, if you do get married, you've not sinned. All right. He's not, he's not somehow suggesting that it's wrong uh, to be married. In fact, Paul in no way forbids marriage. If you look ahead to chapter 9, when he's talking about his rights as, as an apostle, he says, don't we have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife like the other apostles, the Lord's brothers and Cephas? I mean, he's saying, come on. It's, it, and in fact, he would write to the church in Ephesus via Timothy their pastor in 1 Timothy chapter 4, man, the guys that say you shouldn't be married, look what he calls them. It says, the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, 1 Timothy 4, 1, some will depart from the faith. It's actually a departure of the faith when you come up with all these rules. Paying attention, notice, to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons through hypocrisy of liars. Boy, it doesn't get any worse than that. Whose consciences are seared. And notice the first thing that these guys that are, that are uh, d- departed, they're deceitful, they're following teachings of dece- demons, they're hypocrisy of liars, that they forbid marriage. They also demand abstinence from food that God created. That's why I flatly reject anybody that comes along and tells me that there's some sort of a, 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 a sanctified diet, that, a, that as a Christian you really shouldn't eat this or that or another. No way, man. I mean, the, all the jokes aside... You're calling something unclean that God has called clean. Remember the, remember the, 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 the shroud that was let down, the vision of Peter? He said to Peter, don't call anything unclean that I've called clean. Man, bacon is an essential oil. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah. Lard makes the best biscuits. I'm sorry. That's just how it is. That's, that's truth. That's truth right there. That's truth. All right. Amen. <laughs> I got my... <laughs> My pork belly brothers out there. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Paul's not forbidding marriage in any way. But he is saying that if, that if, if you want to get married, you need, to, you need to be aware of something. And then he says something that's rather difficult. He says, such people, verse 28, will have trouble in this life. And I'm trying to spare you. Now, what is that trouble? Obviously, some have said this is the reference to in-laws in the Bible. I don't know that that's true. I don't, I don't know that that's, that's absolutely true. Um, and, and it's not some hee-haw version. Remember growing up on hee-haw? Remember the song, Gloom, Despair, and Agony on Me, Deep Dark? Yeah, he's not talking about marriage being this ball. Of, no, no. He's, he, he's talking about the reality of, of when you're married you do, part of the marriage vows is you vow to love, honor, and cherish. And love means you, you commit yourself to caring. If you're a husband, since that's what I am, I'll talk from that perspective. Uh, husbands, how did Jesus, how did Paul say it in Ephesians? It says, husbands are to love your wives as what? As Christ loved the church. If you love your wife as, it's, as you're supposed to, is that going to be a challenge to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And when he says, this is what I mean, he has to clarify what he just said in verse 20, and the time is limited. And then he breaks into a little bit of a poetic section here. It's kind of interesting. He does that also in 2 Corinthians 8. We might look at that in a minute here. But he says, uh, what, I'm, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is the time is limited. So from now on, those who have wives should be as those who had none. Those who weep as those who did not weep. Those who rejoice as those who did not rejoice. Those who buy as those who didn't own anything. And those who use the world as though they did, did not make full use of it. And then he ends this like poem poetic statement for this world in its current form is passing away. I want you to be without concerns. He's just talking about the reality is when you, uh, when you blend two lives together, it's going to take a lot of work. Amen. Anybody's married a long time, you know what that means. Dee Dee and I are 
this year will be 39 years. Next year, it'll be 40 years married. And yeah, it does take time. Um, and it does take commitment. It does take the sacrificing of yourself. And, you know, when he says the time is limited, I don't know whether that's a reference to the return of Christ. It's certainly the early church thought he was coming right back. Or, or it's the brevity of life. I, I think he, what he's trying to say is we need to develop an eternal perspective on all of life, whether it's marriage, sorrow, joy, possessions, business, service, whatever it is we, we need to. Maybe it would help us to think of the words of Christ. What did he say? Seek first the what? The kingdom of God. Seek you first the kingdom of God. Uh, David Pryor writes this, marriage, bereavement, pleasures, possessions, commerce, and business. That's what he lists there. Let every Christian, I like this, let every Christian hold very loosely to all daily factors of human life. Isn't that true? How many, how many have ruined a marriage because of an over-devotion to a job? Ruined a marriage because of an over-devotion to hobbies? New, ruined a marriage because of an overdevotion to food or whatever else there is. You know, what Paul's saying is if you're going to get married, man, you better count the cost and you better go into it with your eyes on the Lord because that's what it needs. And, and that's his point in verse 32. He says, I want you to be without concerns. Um, some of your translations say, I want you to be without care. Um, the reality is, is that the married person has cares. You have concerns. The unmarried, he says, is man is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And I know some of the wives are going, I wish my husband kind of fit that. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the truth is the married man, his interests are divided. The, the unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord so that she may be both, holy both in body and spirit. But the married woman is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. There, there really is multiple loves in your life. The Lord and he's first, but then, he, then it's your spouse, your husband, or your wife. And that's why he says, I'm saying this in verse 35, for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, but to promote what is proper, and so that you may be devoted to the Lord without distraction. So if you're uh, unhappy, and you're unmarried, and you're seeking marriage, then count the cost. Amen? Count the cost. Well, what about this next group in verse 36 to 38? That's the soon to be married. And to the soon to be married, he says, don't wait too long. <laughs> you know, when you read these verses, the, the question that's been brought before us is, who's Paul speaking to? Is this a father that's giving away his daughter in marriage? Some believe that's, in fact, if you have a New American Standard or an NIV, it'll have that as an alternative translation underneath in the bottom of your footnotes. Um, is this a man who's considering his own virginity, which is the Revised Standard Version? Trans I think the best translation is that this is a young man who is engaged, and the NIV says that, toward the virgin he is engaged to. I think the end of verse 36, it's clear who he's talking to, because it says if, if, if she's getting beyond the usual age for marriage and he feels he should marry... He can do what he wants. He is not sitting. They can get married. I think it's clearly talking to the man who is engaged. Now, why does Paul have to address this? Well, apparently there was in Corinth, as there are in different cultures throughout time, um, those who imposed on people who desired to be married a very long engagement or a long betrothal period. And uh, not so much here in America. You know, I think Dee Dee and I, I'm not the worthy example, but we met July 28th. Um, uh, November 28th, I proposed to her. No, 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 no. We met August 28th. I proposed to her November 28th. I'm impressed that I remember that. We got married July 28th. So we were, from the time I first laid eyes on her, to married, will you take this woman to be, it was 11 months. So we took our time. Now, that's only by comparison. I, we have a good friend. <laughs> they, they got married in Vegas. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and one time when they were talking to, they were telling us about, they said, oh, you should see our wedding picture. <laughs> when, she said, when she said picture, I just burst out laughing. <laughs> because, 
Because we've got like an album, you know, <laughs> like all, how many of you have the albums, you know, two, three hours with the photographer, you know. Yeah, she had to wear a, a picture, you know, it's like after they paid the guy there at the wedding chapel, they went, smile. You know, so I was teasing her about it being a Polaroid, you know. Uh, you know. So some people take even less time than we did, you know. And, uh, but in their day, a uh, long betrothal, especially uh, in the Jewish culture, in the communities, would have been long. Now, is there, an enga- is there, a, is there a benefit to a long engagement? Yes. Um, how many of you wish you were more mature when you got married? Oh my gosh. We were so immature, and Didi especially. I mean, I'm telling you, I was light years ahead of her. She, she's not in here, yeah. Yeah, you just trust me on that. You know, right? You know, you know. Yeah, I was two years older than her, so I was way more mature. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember her dad when I asked for permission on the phone uh, to marry. They were like, yeah, you know, if after a couple of years, you guys, uh, you know. And we're like, oh, we were thinking July. <laughs> and they, you know, went, okay, they went along with it. So it's their fault. No. Um, <clears throat> no, the, if, how many of us wish we were more mature? There is, there is uh, proof not so much that the longer you wait, the more successful I, or that you'll have I just think there's, there is some truth to the fact the more mature you are, the better you have a chance for uh, happiness in marriage. And, and they're fine, but they're only fine if the couple that is engaged is dealing with it in an appropriate manner. And I appreciate the fact that even though Paul's writing as a devoted bachelor and, and a single man, um, <clears throat> he does recognize that from the woman's perspective, it says if she feels uh, she is getting beyond um, the usual age for marriage. In other words, if she's feeling like a mixed, mixed, missed blessing, as it were. Um, I, I tried to look up that prayer um, that was a young woman's prayer. And it was something about the different ages. And now, Lord, I'm this age and I send me someone. But the, I don't remember anything about the, the thing other than the end of it. it says, and now, dear Lord, I'm 35. Just send me someone who's alive. You know, <laughs> that's, that, that's that prayer, you know. Uh, you know, so if she's feeling like, hey, I'm not going to be able to have kids or whatever. We're getting beyond the usual age. She feels she wants to marry. Uh, he can do what he wants. He's not sinning. And in the same way, if, if he has a self-control in verse 37, if he's not under compulsion, but if he has control over his own will and decided to keep her in his heart or keep her in his heart, decided in his heart to keep her as a fiance will do well. So he's saying if you can, if, if she's not feeling left behind and if the, if the man can demonstrate self-control, then that's fine for them to wait. But otherwise, man, um, if not, then get married, get married. Um, and he who he who marries his fiancée does well, but he who does not marry will do better. And so it's not one's wrong, one's right. There's probably a better best in this. But what does he, so what does he say? So what does he say then to everybody? Well, regardless of who you are, marriage to all is marriage is for life. And that's why he reminds them in verse 39, a wife is, is bound to her husband, she is bound as long as her husband is living. But it says if her husband dies, she is free to be married to anyone she wants, only in the Lord. This is one place that this is spoken. There's also another passage that speaks about not being unequally yoked. If you're um, wanting to get married and you're a Christian, you should not consider marrying a non-Christian. And, and I, would do my, I would do two things for you. I would witness to whoever who you're wanting to marry to get them saved so you can get married to them. But I would tell you, you should not marry that person. Why? Because the most important thing in your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if one of you, whether it's the husband or the wife, has devoted yourself to the Lord, and you're going to marry somebody that has no interest in the Lord whatsoever, I would challenge you as to whether or not you have a, a true, deep relationship that is necessary for marriage. And I would also challenge you because it says, man, only in the Lord. Then he says, but she is happier if she remains as she is, in my opinion. I, Paul wasn't married, but he probably knew a lot of guys and probably thought, what a disappointment this guy has turned out to be. And, uh, and that's 
there's probably a dark side to that last verse that's difficult for men to admit to. Um, I've seen some of the studies and seen some of the teachings that that speaks about in the culture in which we live, in which men are often vilified and for just for being a man, and and how difficult the world it seems like. If you act too much like a man, that somehow you're trying to stomp on everybody else. And, and it's a very difficult time for men because do they share that? No, they absolutely do not. Um, they did a, wasn't a scientific study, but they were doing a video asking guys, when you're suffering, when you're hurting, do you tell anybody? And, and nearly every one of the men said, absolutely not. We tend to keep it inside. And the truth is that if I'm probably projecting a little bit here, but there's a lot of men who have been married a long time and I'm one of them, that there are some days when I look at Dee Dee, I I have a deep sense of um, regret that I have not loved her as I should. And that I've been too selfish in my past. And that there have been too many times when I made decisions based on what I want, not necessarily what's best for both of us. And I suppose in those moments when I'm weeping before the Lord in this regard, I just, I just pray that I hadn't, you know, I, I just hope that she's been happy. I hope that if she read verse 40, she's happier if she remained as she is, that she wouldn't say, boy, I wish I'd have, you know, thought this through, you know. Um, wish I had to listen to my dad <laughs> or whatever, you know. Um, the truth is, if you love your wife, then you're going to feel that way. You're going to say, man, I, I haven't always lived up to what I should. And so I think that I also have the Spirit of God. And I think God's calling us men to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Wholeheartedly, devotedly, sacrificially giving of ourselves for our families. So I want to close with Warren Wiersbe. He offers five questions for every person contemplating marriage to consider. First, what is my gift from God? You know, can I, uh, can I live singly? And if I can, maybe God has a different path. Second, am I marrying a believer? If the answer is not, you shouldn't marry. Are the circumstances such that marriage is right? Is this the right time? How will marriage affect my service for Christ? And am I prepared to enter this union for life? So I'm not saying don't marry. I'm saying ask and answer those questions and then go and live happily ever after. And all God's people said, Amen. Father, we pray for our marriages to this church, for those that are married. We pray that, that you would, whatever the marriage needs, healing, strength, support, love, compassion, kindness, you know what is needed. Submission of wills. Whatever you do, you would strengthen our marriages, Father, so that we might um, be a re reflection of of you in our lives, and especially their homes. And uh, Father, for those that are unmarried and happily, I just pray that they would be devoted to your service and you would bless them in, in that regard as well. Thank you for calling all of us to love you with all of our hearts, souls, and mind and strength. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Next week, we're going to deal with uh, eating meat offered to idols. Whew, that'll be an easy one. All right. <laughs> Maybe. We'll, we'll talk about that then. All right. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. Thank you for being part of our service.